Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Research Findings, Rapidly Changing Digital Landscape Puts Product Development Success at Risk. My name is Jess Hall and I'm your moderator for today. I'm the VP of Product Strategy and Design here at 3Pillar Global. So let's take care of a little housekeeping before we get started. All attendees are muted throughout the webinar, but we would love to hear from you. Please type your questions in the question box on your control panel. The presentation will run for 45 minutes and we'll address questions in the last 15 minutes. It's being recorded, so you'll receive a link to the recording in the next day or two. Also, be sure to check out the slides and some research from Forrester that you can download through your control panel. Digital product delivery is a critical component to how companies win, serve, and retain customers today. To better understand the impact of digital transformation in today's market, we at 3Pillar commissioned Forrester Consulting to survey digital product decision makers on how they strategize and prioritize digital product development. Today, we'll re reveal the research findings. Let's get started. Um, here are our presenters. First, we're gonna hear from Chris Kondo. He's a senior analyst of application development delivery from Forrester. And then we're gonna be hearing for, from David DeWolf, president and CEO of 3Pillar Global. David and I wrote the product mindset book together and it's coming out this fall. So Chris, can you kick us off? I sure can, Jess. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, as well, for inviting me here today. I think this is a really um, important piece of research. Uh, and so let's just start it right off. Um, at Forrester, we talk a lot about the age of the customer uh, being, um, you know, responding to customers' needs, listening to the customer, paying attention to the customer. It's really, really important. In fact, it's so important that it's really driving companies to go fast, faster than they've ever gone before, to think about new strategies, to think about new ways to digitally transform. But, you know, what does it mean really, you know, what is this transformation? What's really going on here? And why are things going so fast? And what its impact is on these on these businesses is kind of profound. So when you think about digital transformation, it is all about becoming customer centric. It's all about uh, you know finding ways to measure the response customers have to your products. It's about finding ways to instrument your code, for example, or to measure the response, uh, like net promoter score, to actually see what's going on with customers, to reach out to them directly, to do you know, in-person testing, if you can, using various platforms these days. It's all about really you know, driving that forward. And I think a lot of people think about digital transformation and they say, hey, that's a really overused term. Uh, is anybody really, you know, going through a digital transformation? What does it even mean? But uh, at Forrester, we've actually done research on this and we actually have some very interesting data. So when we um, talk to decision makers uh, around the globe, this is, you know, a, a body of 2,570 of them, 73% tell us they are undergoing or always undergoing uh, some form of state of digital transformation, which is quite a significant number. Um, and of, those, of that number, about 43% say they're currently undergoing a digital transformation. So they're in the midst of it, or we completed our digital transformation in the past 12 months. That's kind of interesting because in Forrester's point of view, you should never be done with a digital transformation. Digital transformation is here to stay. And it means that you're constantly measuring, constantly adjusting and constantly innovating. And so to that point, we actually find that a percentage of our um, respondents 36% say that they're always in a state of digital transformation. And that's why that one's colored green, right? Because it's true. For now into the, you know, into the future's horizon, you're going to always be going, undergoing a state of digital transformation. It's no uh, mistake that, you know, Amazon bought a grocery store. They just see that their digital capabilities are reaching out directly to customers with that type of methodology. It's no, uh, you know, mistake that Airbnb is disrupting the hotel industry because they're reaching directly to customers and allowing them the power of selecting which room they want, finding the prices they want. This has been going on for some time, but it hasn't really affected all the companies in a, a sort of an even way. It's always been these, you know, cloud native or, or highly, you know, innovative companies that are moving forward. But what we're finding today is that this is actually seeping into every traditional industry, every traditional business. And the way this manifests itself is quite interesting. Forrester actually has research on what we call a customer experience index. 
let me explain that. And the customer experience index actually measures several parameters of what the customer experience is. It's not just the digital experience. It's also the, you know, if there's a brick and mortar store, the in-store experience or the experience you have with the product or the experience you have calling up the customer, uh, calling up the, the, the company itself to get help or support or whatever. But by and large, the experiences are driven first and foremost, and demand is driven by the digital experience. So it's very important to take that into context. When Forrester does this research, and it's over hundreds, 110,000 different online consumers who we, we've researched with, we discovered that there's actually a very strong correlation between a customer experience index score and actual revenue. And in fact, we can correlate that improving your customer experience point uh, score by one point can equate to a certain revenue per customer across these various industries. For example, uh, in the hotel industry, if you can improve your customer experience score by one point, you can improve your revenue $7.49 uh, per customer. Now, that might not sound like much, but if you have you know, 10 million customers or 40 million customers, you know, now you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. If you're an auto insurer, it's $14.29 per customer. If you have 15 million customers, that's $214 million. That's real money, that's real revenue on your bottom line, simply by improving your customer experience score and understanding that the customer really does have a major impact on your overall bottom line business. Um, the folks at Forrester actually took this one step further. They took the customer experience score and they looked at all the folks that were customer experience leaders. They compared them to those folks that were customer experience laggards. They normalized their stock price. And what they discovered is that those um, CX leaders beat the laggards in stock price growth 32% compared to uh, 17%. Um, and then, um, or actually, uh, I'm so, yes, uh, to, to 3% actually, the light green is the, is the um, S&P 500. So they outperform the S&P 500 and they greatly outperform their uh, customer experience laggards in stock price. And if you look at total returns, the, you know, 34% are exceeding total returns compared to laggards and compared to customer, the, the standard and poor 500. That's quite significant. Simply by improving your customer experience score, you can outperform the market is what that's saying. It's, that's how it correlates. That's really quite powerful and quite interesting. So there's no wonder that companies are feeling that this need to really think about digital Think about how they're going to reach these customers in new and exciting way. And so, in fact, um, the way we look at it is digital innovators te teach, uh, treat technology as a business asset, right? They, they look at it as just a, a core capability to their business. If you're selling insurance, then you've got to have a digital strategy. You have to be digitally transformed. You have to understand the technology by which you're delivering those policies. If you're in the hotel industry, if you're in the transportation industry, if you're in logistics, if you're in any one of the what we consider traditional industries, companies that have been around for 100 years, if they don't start thinking about things in form of digital technology, digital strategy, and digital capability, they're not understanding that those are true business assets that really can differentiate them from the rest of their business. So it's important to have that. However, however, this particular um, report that we're that we're going to be commenting on in a minute this this commissioned report shows that sometimes being customer centric can come at a cost and that cost is that if you only focus on the customer and the and i mean what i mean by that is the immediate customer needs right in front of you the customer that's walking in your door and complaining about something or you know features that have been that you just feel that you must get in front of them sometimes you miss out on the big picture. Sometimes your business priorities get out of skew and you forget and neglect the fact that you need to have business outcomes and you need to have strategy to go along with customer centricity. So let's dig into this report for a minute. It's quite interesting. Um, Forrester and Three Pillar work together. Um, the, the, the background is in 2019, Three Pillar commissioned Forrester Consulting to evaluate how companies develop digital products and, and experiences. 
We had 154 products uh, and software development decision makers in the US. And if you look at it, the meat of it is really, you know, director and manager, and then on the outliers, vice president, project manager. So we have the folks that are really making these decisions evenly across these three main industry um, uh, verticals, telecommunications, media or leisure, technology and, uh, and or technology service providers. And if you take a look at the revenue, um, the media guy, uh, the, actually the, um, uh, you know, they, they range in different sizes, but, um, but pretty much, you know, we have some good representation across the board here. And so this is a pretty good representative um, uh, group that we wanted to speak with. And we found some very interesting information. Um, the first thing is that uh, digital products and services have a major impact on firm's goals. So we asked this question, thinking of digital products or services your organization has developed, what impact do they have on achieving the following business goals over the next 12 months? And, you know, to no surprise, or actually to, to, good, to good surprise, um, growing revenue was an important piece of that. So the fact that they, their digital products have actually resulted in revenue growth is good. They've improved their customer experience and they've increased their operational efficiency. So all, all really good things, as well as increasing customer retention. All good things, all important uh, things that businesses need to think about. But, but what we discovered though is that um, in certain other cases, things aren't quite so balanced. So when we looked at like firms, you know, please rank the order in which you prioritize the following strategic factors when developing digital products and services. What we discovered is that many firms simply uh, over rotate, if you can use that word, on customer needs, right? 53% are just focused on customer needs, 13% focused on business objectives, 13% on changes in the market. So what does that mean? That means that you've sort of put all your eggs in one basket in some sense, right? You're, you're focused on the customer and you're allowing these other things to sort of lag behind. And um, that has some very interesting implications that this research study discovered as we dug, dig in a little bit deeper. So what we discovered is that firms lack a deep understanding of how to prioritize, act, and deliver on customer data. Only 28% say that they understand their customers' needs. So we have these other slides that say, hey, we're completely focused on the customer, and yet only 28% actually understand their customers' needs. Um, that's very, you know, kind of a telling sort of like, um, you know, two opposites almost, right? Opposite ends of the spectrum. And then we have this other situation where 44% feel their organization's digital products solve customer problems. Well, that's good. So they, they kind of believe that they solve customer product, uh, customer problems, uh, but um, they're still not sure how their customers are using their, uh, how they're, you know, understanding how they're, they're meeting those needs. And so I, you know, you got to wonder, are some people just hoping that they're solving customer problems and, but at the same time, they don't really understand how to measure it. And so when we ask, you know, other kinds of questions from different angles, what challenges do you experience in developing digital products and services, you know, in, in terms of solving customer problems, you know, what it comes out of it is, you know, they encounter problems building and testing code, understanding each market segment, digesting and prioritizing feedback is difficult. Uh, we struggle to obtain meaningful customer usage data. You know, we're unable to connect uh, effort and with value delivered to customers. And so, you know, there's this sort of um, sort of disconnect between, I think what people want to think is that they're solving their customers' problems. And the reality is that they're actually having trouble and difficulty actually figuring out if they are doing that. And it could just be that they're just focused on what's in the backlog, what is the latest bug, without really figuring out how to understand what's going on. Let's take another look at another um, important statistic. So when we ask, um, you know, how, you know, what challenges do you experience in developing digital products or services? There is a lack of regular review update cycles is one of the, is like one of the number one problems, or it's difficult to tie digital initiatives to business outcomes. So when you ask about these questions in this way, you get this kind of telltale data that says we're having trouble actually understanding what value we're delivering. So many firms miss the connection between customer satisfaction and business growth. So 44% say we think about addressing the biggest customer needs first when designing digital solutions. But if they have a hard time actually understanding that, how do, we, how do they actually know they're actually addressing those biggest customer needs, right? 27% feel their organization's digital products or services deliver fast time to value. 
Well, what does that mean? That means that, you know, 73% don't think they're delivering fast enough. So this is a lot of disconnect in all these numbers, a big disconnect in how people are actually assessing themselves. And um, it really just comes down to that, you know, I think co many companies want to serve their customer, but they recognize that they're not doing as good a job as they possibly could. A continuous system of learning is imperative to respond to customer needs. That's pretty much, you know, what, what any sane person would tell you anyways, but um, this is the result, right? We are able to, you know, 35% say we're able to rapidly adapt our digital solutions to changing business needs, customer needs, market conditions, and competition. So only 35% think they can adapt. So if you're constantly focused on the customer and you're thinking about, you know, let's say you own that grocery store down the street and you're thinking about the customer that's coming in the door every day, what happens when, when Amazon buys that grocery store next to you? Did you completely miss out on the fact that there's this whole digital strategy, this whole world going on around you where customers, you know, might not just want to have to walk to the store and pick out all their groceries. They might want to pick them out online and have them waiting for them in a, in a grocery basket when they arrive. Those are the things that are having profound impact on traditional industries is that they're so focused maybe on their, on their immediate customer, they're not really thinking about their future customer. 30% feel their organization's digital products and services adapt to the market. Only 30% feel that way. 70% don't then. And so there's a big blind spot here at, as far as you know, adapting digital services to the, to the total market to make sure that you're addressing your future customer, not just your current customer. So let's take a look at this question five. What challenges do you experience in developing digital products or services adapting to the market? It takes too long to deliver meaningful changes. That's, that's the very top one. Compliance and governance are burdensome, limiting our, our, our capability to innovate. That's a very interesting one, right? That's probably one that, you know, most of those companies that are in that kind of a space, whether it's insurance or financial services, uh, you know, are thinking about, we got to go faster, but how do we go faster with all this, all these shackles around us? How do we manage that? And so trying to figure those things out are part of being customer centric, but sometimes people don't always put those two things together and think about ways to deliver um, solutions faster. There's a lack of, lack of flexibility in the process. So luckily that one's a little bit lower and organization silos uh, uh, inhibit our ability to be agile. That one's really low. And I, you know, my own um, sort of antenna goes up when I see that because we see organizational silos all the time getting in the way. And even if people don't think that there's organizational silos, it turns out there are some hidden ones in most organizations anyways. So even though that's what the data says, I'm saying there's more problems than that, but that's just me. So one of the things that we often say is a strong foundation for digital development is built on a strategy that is customer centric, agile, and accelerates time to value, right? Which of the following benefits has your organization experienced as a result of your digital product service development approach? So companies that focus on digital products and services that focus on that delivery of that approach, 51% see higher revenue, but 10% don't, which is kind of interesting. Um, new customer acquisition, very interesting, 46%. And then faster internal user process, 42%. So clearly folks that are focusing uh, on their digital products and services initiatives are seeing some very real, um, uh, real benefits to this. But if you go to the bottom, which I think is kind of interesting, customer attention. So people that think that they're actually getting, you know, customer attention on their products or, you know, focusing on the customer, they 29% don't see any benefit of all to adopting this digital product and service uh, approach, which is kind of interesting because it should be the opposite of that. So clearly, you know, in some of these companies that aren't seeing any benefit, uh, there's something missing in their strategy. There's something missing where they're not getting the full value of their um, digital, uh, their investment in the digital transformation. And so oftentimes we say that like, you know, sometimes you need to um, take another approach. You need to step back and take a look at things in a bigger picture. So some of the signs that um, <clears throat> customer centricity has gone too far is that you have a single-minded focus on customer issues only. 
right? You're only focused on issues that are coming in from the support team, issues that are related to, you know, bugs coming in that are being reported. It's great to fix those problems, but you really need to figure out a way to manage that. You have an aging architecture. Maybe you have an architecture that's a few years old or five years old. That's already too old. That's already leaving you out of the pack when it comes to being more nimble, being allow your team to work in multiple streams at the same time. You often hear about people saying, hey, you need to go to microservices. It's not just because it's the hip thing. It's not just because it's a great way to, you know, uh, de decouple different services um, so that you have like this sort of like distributed architecture. It allows your team to be distributed as well. Um, inability to rapidly adopt and uh, adapt to new technologies. If you can't um, adapt to the new digital trends, if you can't figure out a way to incorporate, uh, you know, uh, customer touch points directly into your into your product and the way you deliver services, you're probably missing out on a large segment of growing, uh, you know, a growing segment of customers that expect that kind of a touch point. Growing technical debt. Uh, you know, most people don't think about technical debt as architecture that's aging or issues, requirements, things that are being asked for but are never executed upon because you're always fixing the next customer problem. If you have, um, you know, requirements or new features that have been waiting on in the in in the back, uh, you know, of of the archive of your of your Jira or your you know of your or your agile planning tool for months or or six months or a year at a time, that's technical debt, and by now those features are probably useless now anyways you have to reevaluate that constantly lack of new customers do you are you just selling to the same customer base or are you growing new customers if you're not growing new customers it's probably a good sign that you're paying attention to the current customer but not thinking about your future customer and how that's going to bring you new revenue lack of business growth well if you're not getting new customers and all you're doing is growing with your current customer base just think about what happens when your largest customer decides to change change hands and go to another another provider. That's a really big problem, right? If you have too much emphasis on a small number of customers, one customer can completely change your balance sheet. You don't want to have that be the impact of what happens because you've neglected your digital strategy or haven't been thinking far enough in advance. And then the lack of means to measure customer satisfaction and the impact of your efforts on your customers. If all you know is the most recent bug coming in or if you release code and it's like no news is good news and that's the way you measure your, your effort, if that's the way you're measuring whether or not you're successful or not, you're not doing enough. You really need to be thinking about reaching out to your customers. You really need to think about instrumenting your applications to find out who's using them, how they're using them. You need to have performance metrics to make sure that you're not regressing in any kind of performance in any way. You need to make sure that you're you have customer success uh, personnel reaching out and making sure customers are happy to find out what they're looking for. But also you need to think about strategy and how to solve their future needs, not just their current needs. And so uh, to do this, sometimes it takes a different point of view and a different way of doing things from just being purely customer centric. At Forrester, what we discovered is that a good approach to this would be dun, 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 using a product team. So. What does it mean when you're selling insurance, right? Aren't you already selling a product or you're selling financial services? Isn't that your product? Well, think about the way that you're delivering those services. Think about the way you're delivering those products. It's all on digital platforms, digital platforms that are uh, run by software, that are operated by software, that are built using software, right? So you need this product, same product approach to how you encapsulate certain features and certain capabilities with your software capability with your software products. Even if you think that your final product is an insurance policy, you think your final product is some sort of media delivery, you're delivering that experience with software. And that needs to be sort of blended as part of your, you know, in your product strategy. So you break down all the various components it takes to deliver that, um, that experience or deliver that service or deliver your software if that's what you're actually delivering and think about it in terms of products, right? Move away from that project mindset, move to a product mindset. What we've discovered is those companies and those businesses that adopt a product management approach, a product management approach to software development actually do better. So what does that mean? If you think about the various stakeholders that are involved in developing software, you might have executives with, you know, or business analysts uh, with a strategy and a vision. 
you have your application development delivery team. They understand what the design needs to be. They understand their capabilities. They understand what technologies are emerging and what they can do. And then you have customers who are looking to, you know, move further, uh, you know, to be further uh, delighted by your product. All of those three are sort of different stakeholders in this whole game. And right now, without a product sort of focus, what you have is uh, application development teams working in a project kind of manner. You have executives sort of submitting requirements, but not really knowing what's going on. And you have customer sentiments just sort of reaching the customer support team, but maybe not going much further, right? You bring in that product organization and you get this synergy where they're trying to figure out the balance between the executives, between the product team, the, the CMO and the CTO who's managing that software development team. And then you have maybe your um, customer experience managers, you have your customer experience team saying, hey, we have these customers who aren't just looking at current problems, but they're thinking down the road that they really want to have better systems of digital engagement. They want to be um, delighted in different ways. They need a mobile uh, interaction with our insurance or our financial technology, or they want things tied together with their automobile or, or you know, name the digital fad of the day, but that's what customers are looking for. And so product teams can help prioritize that. They can help you balance all the various stakeholders that are going on. And it's, it's really um, kind of profound what we've seen that companies that adopt this sort of mentality are very able to balance customer centricity against strategy, against software delivery capabilities and provide sort of more balanced approach. So when you think about that, think about these rocks that I've been trying to figure out, how are they balanced to, be, to begin with? But it's important, right? It's important to have balance. It's, it's that way with everything in life, right? You have to have some balance. You can't just be completely um, focused on one particular aspect of the business. Balance customer centricity with a product management approach. Balance customer obsession against business objectives. It'll allow you to decide when to invest in new platforms and capabilities and when to maybe hold off on those, right? Maybe maybe you don't wanna be bleeding edge, but you have your eye on that next set of technology capabilities. You know you need to adopt it. Maybe you have to wait for the cost of adoption to go down. That's okay. Think about it ahead of time and find the right time to adopt those technologies. You don't have to be you know, the bleeding edge innovator. You can be a fast follower, but if you're not either of those and you're just on the sidelines, you're gonna be left behind. Don't assume that every customer ask is a must have and be willing to defer them if necessary. We just talked to a really large software company and they talked about the fact that they used to have subject matter experts that represented their customers. And these subject matter experts would say, well, you know, this is the priority, that's a priority. And what they had was this really vanilla attitude, like everything was a high priority. When they actually went out and asked the customers, like, how are you dealing with this problem? They're like, well, we're dealing with it, we're working around it, it's not a big deal, we, we've managed. So they go, oh, that's interesting, maybe we can defer that. How are you managing this problem? They go, oh, that's a real big problem. We've had to solve, we have to create workarounds, we've had to do all sorts of work to actually fix that problem. They go, oh, that's a real issue that we should fix. These other issues that aren't so bad, we can defer those while we invest in our new platform, invest in our new strategy. And so coming up with that balance and actually reaching out and dealing with the customers, selecting maybe you know good customers to talk to on the phone and really reach out and get their honest feedback about your services is so critical because a subject matter expert can only take you so far. You sometimes need a real customer and real feedback and real instrumentation to find out what's going on. Measure the impact of each release to see if your customer obsession is, is even hitting the mark, right? You might find that many new must-have features go unused. It's a very interesting um, research done by Microsoft where they found out that, um, you know, they have this giant Venn diagram that says like, you know, 35% of the features that they test never get used in production. Don't even get used. And it's like, so like, how do you, how do you reconcile that? Well, you instrument, you measure, you capture the metrics of what's going on. You actually come up with what you expect to be the performance of some, if someone's going to be on a shopping cart, how long do you think it should take them to actually check out? If someone's viewing a, a list of insurance policies, how long do you think they should have to view those before they select a policy? 
you should have these ideas in mind and be instrumenting your applications, be capturing information, do experimentation to understand what customers are doing and how they're using your products to really find out if your product's hitting the mark and do people even care about these features. That's why you see a lot of this talk about minimally viable product. The idea that let's put something out there instead of like gold plating it and spending a year working on this brand new giant feature, let's put out a piece of it to see if someone even cares to use it. If they do, and if we get some usage metrics, then we can drive it even further. That's what a product centric approach gives you that perhaps a project centric view won't give you or that subject matter experts versus real customer feedback don't give you. So that's why we say take this balanced approach that allows you to balance customer centricity against business objectives. Think about revenue, think about strategy, think about these things that allow you to actually continue to delight your customers versus just going down the rabbit hole of always serving the most prescient need now and then realizing that you've gone so far down that you you actually can't serve your, your future customers. Chris, thank you for that great context. I'm going to throw it up to throw it over to David. Can you uh, do a deep dive and show us how this is happening in real life? Sure, absolutely. I, I love this research because it really illuminates a lot of what we see on the ground day in and day out. And I think Chris really framed it up for us so well, which is this radical balance that we have to find between customer centricity and thinking about the business outcomes and really driving the outcome we're looking for. And while we're doing that, staying agile and being sure that we can react to the market, right? I think one of the questions is people start to digest this data um, and really understand this research that immediately comes to their mind is, you're talking about taking a product approach, but it's worked forever for me in my IT organization, building software. Why do something different? Um, and I think the question becomes, why does product matter? What, what is it that is different about these digital assets that we're building in this digital economy? And, and Chris began to illuminate that with, with much of the data. And, and the reality is that it is not just an asset, these software products. These software products are the interface to your customer. They are the goods and services that are actually being bought and sold in this digital economy. Uh, he described it so well as um, being the vehicle for delivering um, the modern life insurance policy, or you pick it, everything is being digitized today. Um, and too often we forget that building that digital product that is touching the customer, that is uh, driving revenue growth for an organization is fundamentally different from the types of software that we were building in the age of, of IT, where we were driving operational efficiencies, where we were automating the capturing of data and, and really implementing systems of record. Um, at Three Pillar, in working with our clients, we have found over the years that there are three fundamental differences that really require a different mindset. And these differences are first and foremost that the software product has to self-fund. Right. If we think about other types of software, typically they are supporting an existing business process. They are creating efficiencies within a business. They are saving pennies. But a software product, the entire purpose of it is to drive new revenue is to capture new market share, is to engage customers. It's all about growth. It's not about saving pennies, it's about creating dollars. And in that world, the mentality with which you operate, the judgment calls you make, the trade-offs that you have to make are, are fundamentally different. The second thing that's, that's different about building a digital product in this digital world is that it has to be chosen. Right? It has to be something that is so compelling, has such a value proposition that your customer will choose to use it. And not only that, that typically they're paying for it directly. That's different than other types of software that we build. And so the value proposition has to be thought of actually solving for the needs that Chris was just talking about, not just by what I think a customer may want, what I think they may need, but what they will actually pay for. What is so valuable that, yes, I will open up my wallet more. And that becomes essential as the research showed us, because if you're not creating these business outcomes, you can't continue to meet your customers' needs. And then finally, the other reality is because 
these products have to be chosen. And because the bar is continually being elevated, software products are never done. And so that's the other aspect that's wildly different from this world of projects that we used to live in. In the old world, we could build software, we could put it on the shelf, we could deploy it, and it could be used forever without any upgrades. The reality in this digital world is things are changing so fast, right? Standards and expectations, regulations, you name it, it is always evolving. And clients have such a ability to change, such an ability to choose that if you don't keep up the pace, that you're going to be struggling. You're going to lose the market share that you have worked so hard to gain. And so that's why product matters. And if you think about that world where those things are true, you find that a product mindset is all about driving outcomes, driving outcomes for both your customer as well as driving outcomes for your business. And in order to derive the types of outcomes that you need in this world, there are three principles we found that really help you to stay true to building products that self-fund, that must be chosen and are never done. The first one is a focus on minimizing time to value. Um, uh, Chris really touched on this and, and spoke to a lot of the data. It, it came out very clearly that if you are not continually putting value into your customer's hands, um, then you are not building the type of momentum that you need in your business. And so a product organization thinks about minimizing times to value, thinks about how do I make sure that the dollars that I need to create are incrementally being created along the way, that I'm creating a product that is self-funding, that has validation in the market, that is showing traction and beginning to build the business I intend to build. The second thing is that a truly product organization thinks about solving needs and thinks about the customer, this customer's concentricity centricity is absolutely essential. How do I make sure that I'm solving not just nice to haves? How do I make sure that I'm building for real problems, really for pain points that the customer will be willing to pay for? And so really being intimate with your customer, you know, not being one of the 76% that don't have their handle around what the customer data actually means right? But really is able to dive in and understand needs, not just from what the customer says, but what the customer does and what the customer needs. And then finally, a product organization excels at change. It's not enough anymore to manage change. It's not enough to have um, a mentality of, I will get through the change. A product organization has to navigate the market. Um, the reality is, unlike software from yesterday, we don't know what the requirements are. We are discovering them as they go along. And today's requirements are not the same as tomorrow's. And so it's all about understanding and this intimacy with the customer, which must be layered on top of a discipline around responding to the market, responding to the needs, and really being able to continually iterate and get better and better product out there that becomes more and more valuable over time. What does that look like in this world? Well, we know what it doesn't look like, right? If we rewind and, and earlier in the year, um, we had Hertz being sued by Accenture for a breach of contract. And if you look under the covers, what you find is that Hertz paid $32 million for Accenture to build something that they feel like they never got. Now, you and I don't know the details behind the lawsuit, but if you actually go read those 16 pages, what you find is a couple of themes over and over again that come back to, wow, they really tackled this as a project. They really thought about this as a piece of software they had to build, not as a product, right? What are some of those things that came out in the complaint? Well. Number one, it was this big bang theory of let's just go build their entire website over again. Let's go build a mobile app. It was everything at once. We're gonna, we're gonna gather a bunch of requirements, we're gonna build it, and then we're gonna, we're gonna release with a big bang. There was no discovery along the way. There was no validation. There was no customer feedback. Um, and there was very little testing. Um, in terms of are we building the right thing, but also are we building it the right way? Is it going to scale? Is it going to meet the bar? 
right? The reality is this is the digitization of Hertz's business we're talking about. They are trying to figure out how do they compete in the digital economy and to truly innovate like that and to truly build a modern and revolutionary website and mobile app, you have to think about that as a product and as a platform. This is how our customers interact with our brand and the principles of minimizing time to value, right? Getting something into the hands of the customer early and often, early meaning before $32 million is spent, right? Early meaning within the first million dollars, right? How do you do that? How do you rethink that? Well, in this example, it does not appear that happened, right? Or really meeting needs. Right? It, it is apparent from those 16 pages that it was more about the requirements of rebuilding a website and replatforming a mobile app than it was about really understanding the customer and talking to the customer of what would make your customer experience better. How do we understand what you need? And how do we begin to give you tidbits of that exceptional experience and roll it out a little bit at a time to minimize the time and value? And then finally, in a world where you're trying to build something for $32 million and just be done with it, there's no excelling at change. That's trying to define something up front and then living with the results of what you end up building. So we know that's the, what, you, what, it, what it looks like when you don't have a product mindset. Let's talk about each aspect of the product mindset um, and how it looks when you do thrive at it. One of my favorite examples is actually kind of an old school example. Uh, back in 2011, uh, there was a company that started up called Card Munch. And Card Munch ultimately was acquired by LinkedIn um, as LinkedIn uh, really began to grow and take off. But Card Munch, I think, is the perfect example of minimizing time to value and understanding the need to put working software into the hands of customers to be able to create value early. Card Munch had this concept that they wanted to replace the business card. And in doing that, they felt like leveraging the camera from the phone and using optical recognition to translate that card to directly put it into your address book was the first step to doing it. And so they had this great vision of creating this optical recognition software that used artificial intelligence to translate the words on a card into your address book. But they decided that the most important part of their product was figuring out whether clients actually wanted that. Did customers actually want to use it? So they built a very simple mobile app that put into their customers' hands the ability to take a picture of the business card. And what that mobile app did with that business card was it actually sent it up to the cloud and allowed somebody on the back end to manually transcribe it into a piece of software that would then push it back to the phone. That is the essence of minimizing time to value, building only what it takes to put value in the customer's hands and to then drive that value by seeing the customers sign up and learning from that and iterating on that and building the rich and the expensive technology over time as you navigate along the way. Now, what's fascinating is that CardMunch actually sold to LinkedIn without ever building that core technology. The value of the product was not in this artificial intelligence and optical recognition. The value of the product was in the customer centricity. It was building the value and the traction, and LinkedIn then took that over. That's what it looks like to minimize time to value. Let's look at what does it look like to solve for need. Solving for need is all about understanding your customers. It's all about diving in. The common application you may know, um, perhaps you used it to apply for college. Um, in the olden days, uh, when, when I went to school, it was actually done through fax machines. But this day and age, it's all done through software. And the common ac application provides a single interface for applying to a myriad of schools so that college applicants uh, like my daughter who's going to school this next year just have to fill out their application once and it goes to multiple schools and they provide that interface well the common application um, thought that um, in this day and age of mobile apps um, that the modern student would want to be able to apply for college uh, on their mobile device and that that was natural. And so they, they came up with a uh, mobile strategy that then in order to execute on, they went out and tested 
They tested by talking to actual students. They tested by getting out there and build, bringing students together to talk about what would the ideal experience look like? What is the biggest pain point in your application process? And what they found was that mobile apps were interesting for actually tracking the status of my application and getting updates on the run, but that a college application actually required them to sit down and think through certain aspects. And there were certain things they didn't want to do on the mobile app. They, they preferred a richer experience on a desktop. And so their mobile strategy dramatically shifted as they learned and as they engaged with their customer. That is solving for need, listening to your customer, hearing that, you know, I, I know you're, you're mobile strategy calls for this, but the reality is this is what I want to do on the mobile app. This is what the updates I want to get. This is how I want to use it. Next, let's look at excelling at change. I think we all know Amazon, right? They are thriving in this digital company. Um, but the reality is Amazon does a phenomenal job at reacting to the market. We see it day in and day out on how they evolve their own business as a whole. They're introducing new products all the time. They're killing new products. They're introducing new value propositions. But at the smallest of small levels, what you find in Amazon is that they are releasing new software into the hands of their customers multiple times per minute. It's been said, that on average it's seven or nine seconds they are releasing new software. That is the extreme of accelerating a change. That is the extreme of being able to have cycle time, right? The time from which an idea is created all uh, or conceptualized all the way through when it's executed upon, put through a delivery pipeline and actually released to the customer. If you can release software every nine seconds or even every hour or even every day, you will be dramatically more successful in this product oriented world because customers demand that today because that is how you minimize time to value. And so organizations that are thriving are thinking like Amazon. They're thinking about how are we nimble? How are we flexible? How do we create a software architecture, processes, systems that allow us to move fast and to continually change, continually evolve the products that we're using? So, at the end of the day, I think what we would encourage you, this research clearly shows us that customer centricity is important. That gets a lot of play in this day and age. Uh, it's spoken about a lot in the market, but what we'd like to remind you is that while that is important, it's also important that you keep that focus on those business objectives. You think about minimizing time to value. We have seen more customers who are building what the customer wants versus what they need, and because of that, they're not able to monetize. They're not able to commercialize the products they actually build. And so they become a failure. Um, minimize time to value. Think about that revenue production. Think about creating dollars, not saving pennies. And then make sure that you stay aligned with your customer's needs, really fleshing out what their needs are, not just what, what their wants are. Make sure that you understand that customer data. Make sure you're not one of those organizations that says the customer's need is the most important, but you actually don't get to the bottom of what they actually need, um, especially the most, the most poignant pain points. And then finally, this idea of excelling at change in this digital economy you have to continually evolve. And so everything that you build, has to come back to how do we make sure that we can iterate quickly, have very short cycle times, minimize time to value, and be able to respond to what our customers are asking for in a very nimble fashion that meets their expectations in this digital economy. So with that, I think that's a little bit, Jess, of what it looks like when we are looking at an organization that thinks product, not project. When we're looking at an organization that has balance between customer centricity and their product uh, centricity. Um, with that, I think we want to open it up to questions. Yes, we are ready for questions from our audience. The first one is for you, Chris. Okay. How is the product approach different from a project approach? Sure, it's a great question. Uh, so first of all, when you're in a project mode, basically you're thinking about uh, your success in terms of how much work did I get done? How many work items did I check off my list? Uh, you don't necessarily think about it in terms of, did the customer even care about this? 
Uh, did it actually uh, help them in some meaningful way? Did I improve a business objective? Did this thing I'm working on actually provide value to my business? When you think about it from a product perspective, then you put it in, I guess, in perspective of how does this particular product align with the rest of the um, effort that's going on? Is it necessary to do this now? Can we defer it? Uh, do we, and, and you measure your success in the terms of this particular uh, element of work that we're doing right now is going to benefit and have the following outcomes for the business in the following ways. It might improve customer experience or it might improve revenue or it might improve efficiency or decrease the cost to maintain something. These are all things that are, you know, are in the end helpful to the customer because if you decrease uh, maintenance, that might mean that your software is more reliable. If you have um, improved your ability to deliver more quickly, that means you're more responsive to the customer. Even though the customer maybe didn't ask for that, the fact that you've invested in your capability to do that, because you're thinking product versus project, you're actually delivering real value to the business and the customer. So taking that sort of product mindset where you're trying to incorporate the business, the customer, and what you can deliver uh, in the time frame that you have, it allows you to just think about it all the way through. The other interesting part about a product mindset is that in a project mindset, once you're done with that work item, it goes down the stream and you, you might never, you might forget about it and never know what happened next. In a product mindset, most teams stick with that particular product for a certain amount of time. They, they sort of take ownership of it. They measure customer um, feedback scores. They measure the improvement to the business's efficiency and they continue to refine it like a product. They don't just consider it done. It's just an ongoing living, breathing thing. And so they treat it like that and they, and they stick with it and they have that whole you write it, you own it mentality. That's great. Uh, David, so if we're talking about what this product mindset is and why it's important, how can people get their company to embrace the idea? Hmm. You know, I, I think there was a key word that Chris actually just said that is so important to the answer to this question, which is ownership. Right. I think that's a big difference uh, between a product mindset and a project mindset is the ownership of the business outcomes themselves, the ownership over what you're trying to produce. And, and I think going to your point about how do you foster this mindset within the organization, the first thing that I have found over and over again is that um, a lot of individuals and organizations don't actually understand the essence of why product is different from other types of software. And so they have a software led um, mentality. And I think the first thing I would recommend for everybody is really get rooted in why is product different? And it was fascinating through the process of writing this book, Jess, um, one of the individuals that I was speaking to and fleshing out some of these concepts with and talking to um, was an, an individual who has been a, uh, a leader of product organizations, wildly successful ones, uh, for about the last three decades. And he said, you know, David, I have never been able to articulate why product is different, but you have distilled it for the very first time in putting it into this book. And so I'd really recommend that people go back to those principles I spoke about, really understanding the difference of self-funding products, right? A product must self-fund, a product must be chosen, and products are never done. If you have your handle around that, if you really are grounded that and understand what those mean, and then you're able to espouse them and teach your organization, I think that's the first step. I think the second step is understanding these principles that we talked about and espousing them and creating a culture where you are responding to these realities of, of product with these principles of operating in a way that minimizes time to value, operating in a way to solve for need and excelling at change. And by simply teaching these things to the organization, and, and I mean teaching them at the highest levels from the executive suite all the way down um, to the junior most quality assurance engineer that's automating tests, understanding those things and understanding the context of what are we building and for who and what are the outcomes we're trying to drive because of these realities really, really matters. Um, and then the final thing I would say that surrounds that is culture. We spend a whole chapter in the book talking about what does a culture look like within which a product mindset can thrive. And I think it's absolutely essential to make sure that you have the, the culture that's created from the bottoms up and from the top down in which individuals can operate with this context and make judgment calls in the moment to take the right risks, to, to build the right products, to make the right trade-off decisions. 
Great. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chris, for your time today. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are all the questions that we have. If we didn't get to your question, we'll be in touch via email. In a day or so, this webinar recording will be sent via email so you can come back and reference it. And be sure to go to productmindset.com to sign up for more information and to get your hands on a copy of the book when it comes out in the fall. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much.